Welcome back, everyone, to SuperCloud 3 Live here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. This is theCUBE's SuperCloud 3, our third episode of our quarterly series of SuperCloud. Soon we'll have a physical event bringing everything together, hopefully in 2024. Of course, SuperCloud 4 is coming up in October. It's going to be all about AI. And we have here our distinguished CUBE collective analyst, quasi-analyst on the CUBE, Howie Shu. Only kidding, he's really the SVP of engineering at Palo Alto Networks with AI and ML. Howie, you're practically an analyst. You're on theCUBE so many times. We love having you contribute your knowledge to our community. I want to say thank you and thanks for coming on SuperCloud 3. Very glad to be here. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dave, Great John. To see you. Great to see you. Yeah, and we've, the SuperCloud wave is going. You were there from the first one, two, and three. So let's get into it. SuperCloud 3, rev any revisions to our earlier statements around what's changed because a lot's changed. Llama 2's out, um, security now has a co-pilot today with Microsoft, yesterday with Microsoft. The developer community and open source is booming since we last talked, it continues to rise. Last time we talked, it was January. And uh, I actually mentioned that English language is going to be the programming language. And then Andre Kapathy actually tweeted a, a, a couple of months later. So now it's actually understood by everyone. <laughs> you're, on, you got, you got your, uh, you're on the wave and, and it's great to have you here. Let's unpack the security AI story because if you look at the impact of AI, mainly around these operational aspects. So security is very operational. The pace of play is high. Defense has got to be the priority. Attackers are coming in. AI now, you're seeing the augmentations with a big theme of SuperCloud 1 and 2 is that data driving everything. So with all this new data coming in, what are you seeing that's changing quickly in the architecture of this distributed computing next-gen cloud, SuperCloud? Yeah, I think, you know, security, just like any other industry, it's going to be data and the AI industry, right? You know, data is a very important, as you said. I think another thing that's, I wouldn't say unique, but you know, for a security industry, it's roughly $200 billion industry, half service and a half product. Half service, that means a lot of the you know, work, human, professional work. And then there is a lot of the high end, and then there is a lot of the repetitive work, right? I think AI is here to uh, automate a lot of that. And then there's always a number in the last, uh, about a five or 10 years, people th threw out in the last five or 10 years, which is always at a given time, there are, about a four million or five million um, SOC or security professional openings unfilled. So that leaves a lot of the room for AI to come in. You know, people talk about the job replacement or whatnot. I would say even before that, mm -hmm. you know, how to <laughs> fill the void of that four million, five million unfilled jobs, right? So I think there's a lot of the, you know, the, the human repetitive work, you know, there's a huge uh, potential to remove that. Yeah, Dave, I love what you said when ChatGPT first came out, which you call AI heard around the world, uh, multiple references to that, because it did wake up the mainstream uh, on to see that kind of so-called magic. Uh, for insiders, this, we kind of knew this was coming around, but I loved your take on ChatGPT. You said it makes a smart person smarter and a not so much smart person smart. And I think one of the trends we're hearing in SuperCloud, Howie, is that the creative intellectual capital of the human is augmented significantly with AI. So whether you're a security person or a data scientist or a developer or just a IT person, having the institutional knowledge of your job, that intellectual capital is scaling with AI. This is very much not talked about much. It's, it's mostly gloom and doom. Oh my God, AI is going to kill jobs. But in fact, SuperCloud's the next frontier of IT. It's going to actually, it should help people. It should be an intellectual scale. Yeah. The, if they lean in. Right. Yeah, I think the kind of the example I've been using in the last six months or so is that, you know, imagine you suddenly are able to hire five, you know, very smart interns, right? Uh, they don't necessarily know a lot of domain knowledge, <laughs> but they are very smart interns. You can teach them to do things. And then suddenly, you know, you only need to pay those interns $20 a month. And what are you going to do? The funny thing is for most people in the industry, they don't know how to do with it, right? If I give you five interns, are you really going to leverage them effectively? I think in the next year or two, we are going to you know, either learn it or be forced to learn it or, you know. <laughs> I think we are, we, are, we are on that trajectory, so that's one. The other analogy I will always use is, it's almost like you know, people say, hey, what is the kind of the jobs you know, going away or whatnot? The way I look at it is, you know, like a programmer, for instance, right? You always have lots of programmers. You always have you know, tech lead, right? You know, managers. You know, it's almost like in about three, five years, programmers are all, you know, upgraded, promoted to be tech leads and then managers. 
because you know the a lot of the uh, lower level things will be done by not today yet, right? You know the uh, copilot is is good, but not like you know can do all of the coding. But I think in five, three or five years, you know a lot of the coding it can be done by the copilots. But you still need to understand the architecture. You, you, you still need to understand from the business to you know the the tech stack, right? So that job is not going away. And I think- uh, you, you mean know, the systems thinking kind of the architectural? System thinking, architecture, right? You know, future proof, you know. Uh, that's not going away. That's not going away, right? You know, maybe 20, 30 years, but <laughs> in the foreseeable future, I don't see yeah. that going away. I do see, you know, if you look at a code, you know, GitHub Copilot, what I see is it can do auto completion of a function, but it cannot do auto completion of a file. I think we will see auto completion of a file, but, a file is still not the entire software stack, right? Someone <laughs> so has to do key, that. Right. Yes. And, and I, was, I heard Walter Isaacson the other day uh, you know, oh. pumping his book for Musk. And he was saying, you know, all these jobs, everybody, you know, it, it, he was forever, forever, machines have replaced humans in menial tasks and manual tasks and, you know, the blue collar, white collar people never complained. And now it's changing, right? They're, we're seeing the impact on, on white collar jobs and you're hearing all the complaints of writers and so forth. But to your point, it's going to create new opportunities that never existed. Now, John, the other thing is we love to talk about competition on theCUBE. And you called the ChatGPT your Netscape moment when you first saw the Netscape mm -hmm. browser. And then, Howie, what you said at the time in January was, hey, 100 million gets you into the game of building LLMs. And I think the numbers, you were, you're proven right because the numbers are just coming down further. And that's why we said, we didn't think that OpenAI was going to be able to maintain its first mover advantage. Now, having since since then, OpenAI. No, that was just what you said. That's what I said. <laughs> Open, I you, you would disagree. OpenAI's by far, you know, yeah. on on people's mind shares number one. Microsoft's right there. You know, AWS has dropped down a little bit. You know, even though everybody's been rising. But what's your current thinking? You're not walking that back. If anything, you're doubling down on it. What's your current thinking on what it takes to get into the game? Uh, the foundation model, right? You know, yeah, yeah. In January, I said 100 million would it be the ballpark. I stick to that. I think you know, over the last few months, you saw OpenAI raised a huge round, right? You know, and then they didn't say that um, you know, explicitly, but people are saying that, oh, in the future, you know, OpenAI is going to uh, train the model with you know, a billion dollar budget, right? You know, I think people are saying that. So 100 million dollars seem to be wrong. Uh, but on the other hand, you saw, you know, just uh, Llama 2 released yesterday, right? The, you know, the consensus, right? Of course, they didn't tell people, but, you know, the consensus from the community is it's roughly $20 million training. So I would say, you know, a billion dollar, yeah, you know, maybe, you know, GPT-5 would take a few hundred million dollars, but I think in the long run, it's not going to be. No, but I think you were right about that because your point was it's a lot less than people think. And so that was really your main point. You threw a number out, 100 million. It's actually now. And lower. then your question was, was does OpenAI become a first mover advantage? Right. And we said yes, and my main premise was scale. You said yes. I said yes, and, and my, my rationale was in, in light of even the cost side, was the first mover had scale. If they get to scale, they get to the scale velocity. But I also said open source would win. So at that time, we were talking about the iPhone Android moment. Um, in that a good that analyst does. Hedges his bets. <laughs> no, 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 but, no, but it's a long it's a power law. So you have the primary model at the head of the long tail, but the mid tail and tail of open source, you get smaller models are emerging. Collectively so, is So large. we had also said that it's not, not one model rules the world. It's so not going to be one model, yes. It's a, it's a power law and you're going to see uh, some proprietary big models up top that are hard to replicate with scale, but those trade-offs, they have public information, hallucinations, and then you're going to see a, a fat torso develop and then a long tail in open source and proprietary domain models. So, so the other thing that we debate, which I'd love to get Howie's thoughts on, are is this, is this a trend that is going to favor incumbents or disruptors? W what do you think? Yeah, so I think the analogy I would use, you know, look at the cloud transformation, right? What happened was a lot of the traditional incumbent enterprise software didn't make it. Either didn't make it or didn't thrive, you know, during this cloud transformation. But a few small number of them actually made it and it thrived. That's the Microsoft Adobe of the world. So in terms of the percentage, in terms of the quantity of the incumbents that made it, cloud transformation, it's small. But the net impact of that small number of the incumbents that made it 
Like if you think about Microsoft or Adobe, the value creation in terms of the market cap, in terms of the business value aggregate together, I would say they are probably combined is actually more than the rest of the, I don't know, five or 10 or even potentially 20 SaaS company combined, which is kind of, a, in, in some ways I'm saying that a small number of incumbents that are, that are able to make it, the, the impact that they are going to make is disproportional. Because of their size. Because of the data, because of the size, the customer reach, we all know for enterprise software at least, right? You know, customer reach is a big deal. But right? so doesn't that make it more like the internet, which I would argue favored incumbents more than, than disruptors because of that advantage? We've debated this on the podcast, yeah. Dave. You know. <laughs> what do you think, Alex? Look, you know, there are, again, I stick to what I just said, right? Small number of incumbents that are going to make it, you know, in terms of the total value creation, you know, you know, they, they, they are they actually going to have the advantage. Um, but if you look at the total number of companies, right, the top 20, top 30 interesting players five, 10 years from now, I would say a good number of them are the startups today. Uh, yeah. well, I, know, I know one thing's for sure, everybody else is going to get disrupted, notwithstanding the technology business, yeah. but all of us. Howie, thanks yeah. for making my point, by the way. <laughs> I, I just won the pod bet. We'll hit on, on podcast we'll see. Friday. Yeah, we'll see. No, no, but the thesis went up, but he's right. In most inflection, and this is again, the, the power dynamic, what he's mentioning. In all these inflection points where you have clear visibility on at least a 10 to 20, 30 year stare of the future, and everyone agrees that this is happening, the abstraction gets built and the simplification of the old world gets done and incumbents don't thrive in that environment. They either get replaced, they become extinct, or transform, and the extent that they transform, they have leverage if they do it right. So, and, and we think, unlike the mainframe to mini and mini to LAN and PC, PC LAN, is that they're more agile now to adapt. So I expect Microsoft, they did that, look at them. Look at Microsoft right now versus say AWS. We just heard Matt Garman. They're in a great position too. Amazon's not losing, but they're an incumbent. Microsoft's winning the, the PR but, game. But, but you guys are I think I just, I, I beg to defer. Um, so they are losing in my opinion, at least for, you know, small sample of the customers, you know, I talk to, I'm aware of, they were, they, they were, or they are, you know, AWS shops, but now they are thinking about the Azure, right? You know, I think, you know, I, I don't think we can uh, underestimate that trend. Yeah, and the $30 um, subscription is only going to accelerate Azure services. Okay, but there's an example of an incumbent, okay, so I'm saying the incumbents are going to win, okay. but, but you're saying AWS is ripe for disruption. Well, they are being, he's, his point is right, they are being disrupted, but they're still not the second cloud. They're still number one, they're still winning. It's just for the first time in their history, when, if you went back a, two years ago and, and polled an Amazon customer and said, hey, would you like to go to Azure? We'll pay you to move to Azure. They weren't moving, even if they were paid to. The incentives, uh -huh. and today that's changed. And his point is right on. And Microsoft is starting to chip away at the loyal Amazon customers to By move the way, over. Go back six months ago when ChatGPT first came out, all the, the first week, all of the energies, you know, were focusing on it's going to replace uh, the search engine. Uh, I was one of the <laughs> few, you know, um, a few people actually uh, stood out and say, no, oh, the well, biggest yeah. change is actually the impact is on cloud. Yep. I think six months later, I mean, we're still talking about, you know, disrupting search, but it's going to be a little bit further away. I think the enterprise software is really the, yep. you know, proven to be, you know, where the most of the energy yeah, and is. And, yeah, we, and, we, and, you, and we were with you on that, and we, and totally. we were first. And yeah. you were right, and that's not going to stop, by the way. I think you're going to see the gloves come off from Amazon. And by the way, the market of builders versus hosting is an interesting paradigm, because right now, if you look at the adoption of, say, AI, um, are we in a builder mode or are we in a hosting mode? So as things start going, where's that, I say a hosting, you know, generically, meaning moving to the cloud. Obviously you, you host AI on the cloud or, or on-prem. Um, when you build an app, you got to host it somewhere. Yeah, the other thing, you know, a lot of people, I, I saw a lot of people talking about today, you know, hey, six months later after ChatGPT was out, how come there are not so many killer applications, right? And I don't know about the consumer side, but at least for the business side, I disagree because, you know, I think there will be a lot, but enterprise software um, usually takes time to build, right? You know, it's not just a split second, you have a next generation. It takes some time, you know, for the API to mature, for the software to sort of adapt to this new kind of a, <laughs> uh, the, the, the uh, large language model being the mm -hmm. platform, right? Replatform it. I think in six, 
12, 18 months, there will be a lot of the killer applications. And in three, five years, you know, everyone will have, you know, every enterprise will have lots of the copilot-ish. Yep. Um, Chat GPT is a killer application. But, but that's a good yeah. point. Let's say on this People one. are saying that other than Chat GPT, yeah. what else? Yeah, right? yeah. That was well, hold on. This is a great point because you can't just put a wrapper around Chat GPT. Those are fake apps as far exactly. as I'm With can. no differentiation. No, but he's right. This is a really big point because what is the gestation period of these apps? And, and you know, the conversation that's having, we should be having is, What's the acceleration compression timetable? Because one of the premises is that AI accelerates value, so the time to value or product market fit can be accelerated. Yeah. So if that's now available, I think you're going to see ventures pop up fast and hit escape velocity. What's your, uh, what's your take on that? How fast does AI change the game on product market fit and time to value? Yeah, I, I kind of said it. If you look at a cloud, right, you know, AWS came out, EC2 2007-ish, right? It probably took you know at least five years before most people even understood it, right? I think at this time it will take a much shorter time, you know, but it's not going to be <laughs> five months, right? That's why you know six months later you don't see co-pilots left and right, you know. There are a lot of announcements, but that's a different story, you know. <laughs> the, the real products, you know, it take time to, yeah. you know. I think the, the the digestion of this new platform. It's, you are talking about year or two, right? You know, th then there will be playbook, yeah. there will be best practice, uh, and in three, five years, it should be yeah. everything. I think it's a tsunami it. of apps. We heard yesterday about the, um, someone was talking about an example of software for house, managing housing. Outside of managing one or two units to 300, there's a gap. The cost to build the software is going to get lower. Therefore, these markets that were unreachable before are going to be open. That's so why I do think, I do agree with the disruption. SaaS gets disrupted, in my view. Cloud, okay, so cloud and SaaS. So it's going to be really interesting to see 10 years down who makes it through. AWS, potential disruption, Salesforce, ServiceNow. Are these guys going to be stronger or weaker 10 years from now? I think stronger. I mean, Howie makes a great point. Okay. Again, I keep coming back to the power law. If you look at- Benefits and companies. Matt power Harmon law. just talked about it, about proprietary models and you got third party models, then open source has got a slew of long tail, unique things coming out that might look small on paper, but have evergreen and unique domain expertise. And collectively they're large. So like, like, yeah. like audiences and the power law will stretch out and the head and the neck and the torso will be much fatter and then the long tail. So if that happens, then apps will take the same trajectory, in my opinion. And then, and, and the economics are irrelevant based upon the cost to build them and the available markets that are out there. So yeah. I, I, think I would even stretch this a little bit further. You know, we're, we have been talking about big company incumbents, right? I think there is also another thing I'm seeing that is, you know, to start a company, to do a project, to, to turn out, you know, a, a product that people, lots of people would use, you probably don't need an army of people anymore, right? You know, think about a mid-journey, 11 people, right? Got the entire world, you know, sort of a <laughs> <laughs> around it. And um, I think, uh, you know, talking about the, uh, the, the uh, programmer's job I I evolution I was, you know, referring to just now, I think what's going to happen is, you know, in the past, you know, if I'm a, you know, product manager, product leader, I need to hire 10 people in, in order for me to do anything. Today, you know, I can just leverage AI technology, right? You know, and then get going without the 10 people. So, you know, you were asking me right before the show, we were chatting, hey, you know, in the startup land, landscape, what's happening? And I felt like, you know, entrepreneurship, right? You know, will evolve a little bit towards the solo Entrepreneur, right? You know, they will, we will see a lot more solopreneur than you know the traditional version yeah. of the entrepreneur. Because they got a smaller co teams. <laughs> Because they have co-pilots, yeah. they have AI. Their tech stack is not is not the same as before, and they can get a lot done. It's almost right? abstracted away. The tech stack could be abstracted away. Essentially, your CTO could be a, a co-pilot, yeah. and we, you can talk to it. And we're we're talking about super cloud, right? You know, the definition of cloud is evolving, yeah. right? You know, definition of cloud in the past is compute storage. Now it's the you know the <laughs> the large language model <laughs> abstraction, yeah, right? Yeah, and scale and data play a huge role in that. And this big, big data part. will be a data will be a huge thing. Okay, so final question before we wrap up here: the role of data has come out. If you believe the long tail of of, of of open source models, foundation models coming out, the role of data becomes the new IP. So intellectual knowledge, human knowledge, we check, that's, that's IP. Data is valuable. Your thoughts on data as intellectual property? 
Yeah, I talk about it, you know, in, uh, from a few different dimensions. You know, one, you know, we were talking about foundation model. People say, well, you know, all the internet data has been, you know, <laughs> already ingested. You know, there's, a, there's no room to grow, right? I actually disagree. One is there is, especially in the enterprise software, there's so much proprietary data that has yet, yet to be understood, ingested uh, to those foundation models yet, right? You know, that's one area. The other thing, you know, I actually agree with Elon Musk uh, last Friday, he was talking about, hey, the, the future, a lot of the data, gen, you know, um, the model will generate, you know, they're just like AlphaGo, you know, AlphaZero, AlphaGo sort of the be the world champion four by one, but AlphaZero is like, uh, you know, hands down, why? Because it generates a lot of data automatically. So that's that. So let's just focus, the last thing I wanted to just focus on the enterprise side, right, enterprise software. All the big companies, right, you know, are, have advantage by definition. That's a good story. Uh, the not so good story is, you know, you still need to do a lot of work to understand what sort of data you have. What's the what's the gap, right? Privacy issue, right? You know, do you really capture? Did, did you capture 100% data you needed to to do the value, or you only capture 60%? Do you have a plan? Do you have an understanding? I think you know that you know will differentiate, you know, especially for the incumbents if you are kind of a very keen on those kind of things, understand the gap or understand the, the type of work, then you can, you know, potentially thrive. Otherwise you will have a, you know, lip service. Yeah, you know, we are the incumbents, we have the data, we have all the data, we have more data. Than, but when you double click, triple click, that's not a case. I'll give you just one quick example. Uh, Sarah Gore, right, the ex, you know, uh, general partner of Greylock, uh, my good friend, you know, I invited her to, you know, uh, Palo Alto Network uh, leadership. Mm. Uh, I did a five-sided chat, right? You know, I asked her about the, the, the data side. And then she said hey, she, she's backing, a, you know, one of the uh, co-pilot, the, the, the GitHub co-pilot uh, architect, right? You know, that person left. I'm not going to talk about what exactly what, what he's doing. But his, his notion is, hey, you know, I'm going to do a, you know, um, you know, vertical area. And I know those companies have all the data. So they, he went to those companies and then he found out in order for me to go the co-pilot for the vertical areas, a lot of the data he needs is not there because they didn't care to collect those data because they didn't curate those data. So he now has to, you know, think, I wouldn't think from scratch, but think, you know, <laughs> much harder than he originally thought at least, right? So the, the point I'm trying to make is, it's not just the volume, you have it, you need to double click, triple click. Yeah. And I would say, you know, that's, that's quality that's data, quality, right? Quality trumps the quantity. Yeah. And then there's a paper, you know, you were, you were talking about the open source model. There was a paper just uh, uh, two months ago or so, right? You know, less is more, right? You, you can use a thousand um, high quality, fine tuned data, uh, Q&A to get a very, you know, pretty high quality sort of the uh, llama based um, uh, fine tuned model. It's only a thousand, you're right. You don't need a gazillion. And uh, that, you know, that's very, very telling, right? Quality, it's the quality, not the quantity. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and the startup community is booming. Great, great insight. Howie, thanks so much for being part of our CUBE community and collective. Your contributions are awesome. Love hearing the masterclass and what you're thinking. Love your blog posts. You post a lot on LinkedIn. Check out Howie Shu on LinkedIn. He's got a lot of great content. Of course, he's also the SVP of engineering for AI and ML at Palo Alto Networks. Howie, great to see you and thanks for coming on SuperCloud. Thank you. All right. I'm Jeffrey Dave Velazquez with Howie Shu here for the CUBE conversation around AI and SuperCloud 3, laying it all out. And don't forget, SuperCloud 4 is in October. Mark your calendars. That's going to be all about AI, so we're going to go deep. We'll be right back with SuperCloud 3 after this short break.